here we are. Hi, <laughs> everyone. Um, I'm Aria Harvey. This is my manservant, Michael. Sorry. <laughs> this is Michael. Uh, we're here to talk to you about uh, a video game, uh, the first game we ever made. And as a matter of fact, we made games for 13 years. Um, but we're here to talk to you about The Endless Forest, which is the first video game we ever released. It wasn't exactly the first we made. Um, um, anyway, Michael? Hi, yeah. Um, we're currently remaking the game. Um, this is uh, something we posted uh, the day before yesterday about uh, the status of the current remake. So this is our, the you know, the beginning of the making of the game running in Unreal Engine. Um, it's put together in a very different way than the original was. We'll, we'll, men we'll talk about that uh, later. But uh, first I think we will go over the the whole history of how, yeah. how, how and when we did this And thing. a bit about what the game is, too. Um, so you can understand how this is a very momentous thing, in a way. Um, OK, yeah, so. Sure. The Endless Forest is a game we uh, put out in 2005, and it's a game where it's a multiplayer game, basically, where everyone pl in the, who's in the game, all the creatures that you see, or rather than the deer, are played by humans. Um, there are no puzzles or battles in this game. There's no chat either. Um, those buttons that you saw along the bottom, those are ways that you can uh, interact with the world, and there's plenty of wonderful things that you can do that are very fun, and it's a very funny game. You kind of can't play it without laughing. You can okay. Oh, yeah, you can't change your own appearance in the game, but you can change the appearance of other creatures by by picking up magical spells. So that's one of the activities that you can engage in. There's like um, several like yeah special areas in the in the game, like this this ruin of a of a church that's in the game, and um, this hill where there's like a statue of we call them the twin gods. Um, there's that that refers to another aspect. You see them floating. That happens when Uriah and I enter the game and we're sort of the gods and we can make it rain, for instance. Everybody follows. There's yeah. parties going on. You see this the interface here <laughs> where we, we can do all these kinds of things happening so it creates a contact, contact with the, the players, like yeah. fog. At Halloween, um, which started here actually in 2007, every year is, it's repeated. We have this big zombie deer enter and dancing with the other and deer. The and, place becomes very and then they can get it. And yeah, these are uh, things that we want to do in the future. These are drawings, but 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 yes, this is a good one. See the frame rate. It's like a that's throw. the game when there's a lot of people playing yeah. it, and, and so we have a, a, a kind of. I mean, it's because yeah, that's that's what happens. So, <laughs> so that that's why we decided. Well, okay, maybe we need to think about rethink the history of the project and where we want it to go in the future. Um, the game started actually as a prototype that was commissioned by the Museum Mudam in Luxembourg, Museum of Modern Art in Luxembourg. And it was before they had built their building. Um, it's now a grand palace of art, but it was at the time nothing. And they had only an online gallery. And they came to us. Uh, our previous life was as net artists, um, a bit like Mouchette, the, um, who opened up our <laughs> day. Um, but uh, we were moving into the field of video games, and we, want, we were eager to create an online multiplayer uh, experience. And um, so we asked them, oh, you want an online gallery thing? So can we make this pro this um, game where everyone plays the deer in a forest? And they, of course, were like, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead, do it. So th yeah, that's where it started. At the time, it was just a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but what is this? Uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, but but later um, I, I want to point this out because mm -hmm. it's it connects to um, um, into the whole project in the, with Mouchette, um is that <coughs> it, it actually turned into a multiplayer game and they hosted the server for us, which we thought was an excellent way for a physical bricks and mortar museum to support uh, online art, um, not by putting our work into their mausoleum basically, but but supporting it where it actually lives which is online. So they actually paid for this server. The, the staff completely changed at the museum and they were still paying for it up until like 2012, 2012 when somebody noticed, hey, we're paying for this. What is this, this thing we're paying for? <laughs> they didn't know what it was. And so, so then they just wrote us as if we had been taking advantage of the so museum. So they evicted us in a way. They gave us three months to move out. <laughs> yeah, basically. So now the, the players are helping to support the cost yeah. of the So it's server. a very funny thing about this issue of institutions and, and how you get support and how they're very enthusiastic and then over time they forget what their uh, mandate 
was to begin with or something. Um, it's important also to point out that in the beginning, this game was a, a screensaver. So the, the whole concept initially was that, um, and in the first phase, was that uh, your computer would go to sleep and you would wake up as a deer in a forest, basically. And it was almost like it meant to be a dream that your computer was having, that you became this animal and this it, creature. It was made when the sort of the, the World Wide Web fell apart, when the blogging started and Facebook and all those things. And it was kind of a romantic tribute to this feeling of this, this virtual cyberspace that we were involved in yeah. at the end of the 90s, sort of. So it yeah. was it's almost like a, a, a metaphor for that. <laughs> yeah, so we developed the game in phases and um, because it's very expensive to make a video game, especially a multiplayer game, it's almost considered to be an impossible task, but we did it anyway. Um, our first, this is a, just a note to say that our very first game, so like The Endless Forest was actually our second, but the, the first only also didn't make it past the prototyping stage and it was when we were learning how the game industry worked and how impossible it was to get um, good ideas out there. There was no such thing as independent publishing yet. We needed a publisher to officially put our work out, put it on discs, put it in a store, etc. And we were very dissatisfied with that and couldn't really navigate within that system. So we were totally happy when uh, to work with uh, Mudan Museum on this. And so time went on. Um, we we had the, our initial prototype available through Mudan, but we continued to work on it and to um, seek funding um, through arts funding, basically, and other opportunities to develop this online game. Um, so in 2005, we put the game out. And we we didn't really expect people to want to play it exactly. We just said, put it out there and see who shows up, basically. And uh, uh, much to our surprise, it became extremely popular. Um, and so um, this, this scene is sort of just showing where we were in the beginning of us putting it together, different ways that we tried to test the game and stuff like that. Um, the game was based on, um, or inspiration was, oh, maybe you can talk about this. Well, that's also inspiration. Yeah, I mean, of inspiration. one of the things is the, the legend of St. Hubert, who was a nobleman who saw a deer with a crucifix and then converted to Christianity, became the first bishop of Liège in Belgium. But, you know, we, that inspired us for, to put something between, and to have deer at all, even we went to forest, both uh, virtual and real forest, like we went, we, yeah. we looked at We did games, a big survey of video game forests. Yeah, it's and just, you know, inspirational <laughs> yeah. material. There's also this sort of Studio Ghibli, if you know this, uh, the, these um, uh, car animations, animes. Um, uh, we worked with this uh, really good friend of ours, Lina Kusaite, uh, who grew up in Lithuania, and she has this very strong connection to the forest, and she also was going through a big Princess Mononoke phase. <laughs> and so she kept drawing us deer with faces. We were like, no, no, just a regular deer. We just want to have a regular deer. She kept giving us these beautiful, amazing drawings with deer with a face, and we're like, okay, fine, let's do it. At least it'll set it apart from um, everything else that's out there and we thought it would be like denoting the magic of the forest and indeed people either thought were horrified and scared by this or they were like really into it and it, it sort of gave them a way to identify with the deer in a way and in inhabiting that body um, that we were putting them in. So yeah, uh, in the very beginning of the project, some curator sort of asked what we were doing, invited us to participate in, in an a exhibition that was going to take place on the grounds of a former monastery, of which you see the ruins here. And we took that sort of, because we were, before when we were making websites, we were often asked to show in exhibitions, and it was always awkward, because we make our work for people's living rooms, basically, or, or at home. Um, and, and, and then they asked us to do something, yeah, in in their space, with their space, and so this this was sort of I think the first time that we reversed this idea, and that we said, okay, no, instead of putting our work in your space, we'll take your space and put it in our work. Right. Um, so we went to Inama, the place where this happened, took these pictures, and. Um, yeah, yeah. And, uh, that was the exhibition, and they made these boxes, put the game in it. But as you can see, a, we, this ruin that, that is there is actually based on the physical dimensions and, and shape of, of the ruin, that they don't really know what the church actually looked like. We just imagined yeah. what it was sort of like archaeology in a way. And then we had, a, during the event, was, there was a little game. There were like, you see these glowing things. Those were souls, souls that could be captured in the forest. And then in the end, there's like, uh, depending on how many 
these souls were converted, like the St. Hubert uh, thing, um, they, they would, uh, I think the converted souls were, would turn into gravestones and uh, the ones that remained pagan would become like pagan statues around. <laughs> but this was our way of decorating the world. So like now all of this stuff, everything, every time we had an opportunity like this, whatever we created to put in the game became a part of the game permanently. So during this conversion of souls, little uh, mini game thing, it was actually decorating the world and the world still looks exactly as it did based on the activity of the people who played it during that first time in 2005. Um, so in December? So then it, uh, some time went on and we had released the first phase and then we, uh, what, what is it, we, we added more activities, um, started adding more activities like running and um, hopping, rubbing against trees, sniffing each other, listening, which allowed you to find other people. Um, but we were very insistent on this idea of you being identified only through these, this pictogram that's through your, that's in your app. We had experiences with uh, like online multiplayer environments where people would use the way that you could communicate to either chat about things that were totally unrelated to your artwork or, or to simply insult each other they would even use you know their own their, their usernames as like I'm Mr. Dighead or whatever to upset people or so we wanted to get rid of all of that yeah. and, and also remove the, the language barriers because it's the internet and you know people come from all over the place and we don't, didn't want to give anybody an advantage by having to, by being able to speak in their mother tongue yeah. So everybody is a deer yeah. in, in the endless forest. Um, and, <laughs> and you don't yeah. talk. And so we also, uh, we were playing, we had a plan for the game as a game, right? We, we were very beginner game developers and we had a, this idea in our heads of what we wanted to make. But as people started joining the game, we started paying more and more attention to what they were actually doing instead of what we wanted or thought we wanted. Um, and so we started do, making things based on what people were doing in the game. So for example, responding to the activities of the players, things like mushroom circles, where people, as I said, your computer would go to sleep, you would go to sleep and you would wake up, but it's like you as a deer would remain sleeping. So we started putting in these mushroom circles around sleeping deer, and if they slept there more than five minutes, they would uh, get a, spe a special spell collection, uh, a collect a special spell that would allow them to turn other players into frogs. Um, that was one thing that happened, and then this, we started putting these little cage in because <laughs> there was a guy who was just always there, and we did, we always stand in the same spot in the game and we didn't know why we were like is his computer broken did he walk away does he just like having this as a screensaver so we put a little cage over him and, and hoped he would notice and email us or something and so, stuff like that just experiments with like how can we interact with our players um anyway so that was all phase one and then phase two we're just going to go through really quickly because we don't have that much time there's so much to say about this game anyway phase two included things like we added a water feature we started developing this idea idea of the twin gods, um, Michael and I, who would come into the to the forest and giving, the, in a way, trying to put a layer of mythology over the over the forest. So this crying idol who's at the end of this um, canal um, that leads into a pool and it looks like the, the pool, while the water is source, is the source of the water is coming from the idol, for example. And um, also when you go to the, the two white statues that are on the hill, Twin Gods Hill, um, and you can pray in front of the statues, so to speak, and you, become, you turn completely white and glowing and there's a special sound and then you can pass on this um, this um, holiness to other deer and you're all running around glowing white deer um, things like this um, but also phase two introduced a lot more forest magic the ability to um, change yeah, so each in multiplayer appearance. games one of the main the main important features to a lot of people is the way that your character looks so I would spend hours doing that and then when I'm done play the game for five minutes and quit so this became an important feature to the end of the forest too. Only we reversed the idea you, you, that by allowing people not to change their own appearance, but to change somebody else. They would like rub against the tree and then get a spell to change the, the pelt of a deer or give them a mask or special antlers or even change them into a completely other, other deer. And um, so the, because there's no, no, no missions or goals uh, in, in the endless forest, this became an activity that a lot of players sort of invented games about and, and they mm -hmm. got attached to certain looks but since the spells were given randomly it could take them a long time to achieve those looks and it, it required collaboration. 
Yeah. And then on top of that, this idea of us as the Twin Gods, we developed that a lot more around, a, um, well, we'll talk about the festival that it was a part of. Oh, yeah, on the next slide. Um, but anyway, um, we wanted to have parties in the forest. And so we wanted to, uh, we developed this whole system where we would change the world. So there's no like night and day system. There's no weather or anything like that. But we would come into the world and that's how they would feel our presence is suddenly we would turn day into night. We would make it snow, big bubbles, fireworks of flowers, the whole nine, like fire or whatever we wanted um, and that would be this real transformation of this of this game world and so they would feel the presence of the creator so to speak <laughs> um, this was developed around the uh, um, the it's artifact festival commission. yeah it was a commission in 2006 um, where this this was a festival of performance performance and so we created this lot performance thing that we could perform live um, and also we had uh, arcade cabinets and things like that that we added to this festival and that was pretty fun and so this became a sort of tradition for a while, for quite a few years, we would have um, around holidays, so Dia de los Muertos or um, Epiphany or whatever, we would just find an occasion and create this party and tell everybody, okay, show up in the game at this time and we're going to do something amazing. And we would develop different um, effects for the screen or whatever. It was sort of like this um, crazy VJ situation where we could just do this for whoever showed up and they would participate by being dear. Um, yeah, <laughs> lots of fun. people did show up. Um, so much so that several times we had to upgrade the server to allow for more people to do but the problem was uh, happened the server could manage it just fine but um, the the clients that people were using all those deers being rendered by the computer shouldn't got the effect of this frame rate getting really slow yeah. and this computer unstable so we were already at, at some point we had to stop doing these right. events because we just couldn't like yeah. <laughs> crash people's computer all the time. Um, another feature, and, and this was strange because we couldn't even advertise. We were very proud of the game, but we couldn't tell anybody about it because we were afraid that it there would be too yeah. many players. It was a screensaver. <laughs> yeah, so, so it just started. A screensaver started getting out of hand. We got kept getting asked to do things. So in this case, it was a children's festival or a festival of art for children. We'll put it that way. Um, run by an organization in um, in Belgium called Rasa. The exhibition was called Pixel Me and. Um, um, so we created a baby deer, um, and so we decided that when people first start in the game, they would be this young fawn, this fawn deer, and then they would have to grow up and uh, stuff like that, and it was very cute. And um, is that a... a yeah, okay, we're almost there. Um, we'll skip over this. Phase three. Um, so this is, now we're talking about what we want to do, the expansions, or rather, no, 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 no this is still the expansion. Still, okay, This briefly. is just showing how the, the, the forest expands. So it get, it, while it's endless, so it's wrapped wraps around, uh, it keeps getting bigger too before you wrap around. So this is where we are now, actually. This is what we're trying to yeah. remake. So right, we're still remaking things. We added uh, grasslands to the world and what place we call the playground. Um, really fun for another exhibition at an um, art museum in uh, Kortrijk in Belgium. Uh, we looked at the paintings of uh, Van Ruestal. Or no, Savry. Savry, Roland Savry, and uh, developed this uh, place called the Drinkplatz, which is, allows the deer to have a bit of the forest magic that we norm that is normally reserved for us as gods. They can go here and drink from this fountain and turn themselves into different animals, rabbits, f frogs, or whatever. And the more deer who come there, the more crazy things get. Rainbows start appearing and lightning and all the kinds of things without us having to, to enable it. Um, we worked with uh, we're, we worked with students at the local university um, to and also. Um, yeah, a lot of players are side, yeah. incredibly creative. So all these drawings that you see on the left-hand side of these duos are actually made by players when they start sort of imagining new looks for these deer. And, and the, I mean, there's many, many more than, than yeah. these. And we sort of put these together with uh, students, student of game design, to actually make these. And so yeah. these, these are in a game now, so as part of our carnival Mardi Gras <laughs> celebration. Yeah. So, so the thing was, we, we were like, well, what do we do with the game now? Like, uh, like over over 15 years later or something like this, like, I don't know, what, how many years later? 13, um, 13 years later. Um, this is exa more examples of fan art and things that have happened over the years. They made fan calendars, they've made toys, they've made jewelry, they've made countless stories, fan we, this albums. This game hasn't been updated um, in like seven or eight years, but yeah, it keeps going. Like, we've had music, we've had everything, a, a plays, like, you can't even imagine, like, everything. Um, and this is, um, <laughs> I don't know what you were going okay. for. No, 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 this is... 
only trouble. have a minute, so it's it important. Yeah. Yes, it's important because <laughs> the path or, or game inspired sort of by the Endless Forest, um, and which became our most successful game commercially, um, broke because Windows updated itself and it doesn't work anymore. Um, so we were worried that the Endless Forest, which was still so very active, would break too. So that was another reason why it became sort of uh, our desire started to, to remake it. Yeah. So we asked to try to get arts funding, but we had a similar problem as uh, as, uh, as was, was discussed before, that arts funding isn't going to give you money for a technical update, even though it is required to continue the art. So, uh, so we did a crowdsourcing campaign and we barely made it, thanks to the organization here actually, who sort of rounded off our, our budget. Um, then again, we uh, totally underestimated the budget, so yeah. you can still go to that URL and help <laughs> us. <laughs> because the game has all, all this time been free and we've always felt that to monetize it, as they say, would kill it, because we've seen games that are on a poor for pay model come and go, but we're still here, you know what I mean? So it's like the game is online because we want it to be there. And as long as we want it to be there, it'll be there. It's not an economic decision in a way, it's an, it's an act of will or something. Um, so we decided to remake it all and we would probably try to remake it all even if the crowdfunding hadn't worked out. But it's just, you know, it's that unseen labor, you know, invisible, so-called invisible labor thing. We would much prefer to be able to eat while we remake the game, um, stuff like that. Um, and and also, I mean, you know, even though it's us, I mean, it's like, it's it's a lot of work to do. These are the different step-by-steps -step that the um, remake has taken so far. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about this in the next slide? Mm, well, no, we can show it, because it's kind of yeah. interesting to see. On the left is like the original engine, which is Quest 3D, and the right is Unreal. Both have visual interfaces, but the big difference is that the first one ran in real time, so you didn't compile the code, which was very influential for the design of the game, because mm -hmm. we literally programmed the game while people were playing it. We literally were logged in into the game and so they saw us. No, they didn't see the programming but they saw our character and things our like that. Our divine hand. That's a very different way of, and I think we couldn't have designed that kind of game without that kind of engine. Mm -hmm. Unreal is while much more stable and reliable and much more sort of honed towards this kind of game-like uh, uh, program um, isn't, doesn't allow for that kind of freeform um, development, um, Maya. Mm -hmm. it works. It's very yeah. good. And so it allows for this. This is kind of cool because you, you, they force you to do like this object-oriented programming, which means that you can just say, I want 10 times more trees. And you can just do that very quickly. Yeah. So that's kind of cool. Maybe in the future we can play with that. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of stuff <laughs> that we want to do for the future. We're pretty much done here. Um, but uh, going back to, we want to go back to uh, concepts that the players have had over the years and different types of animals and different types of events that we can do in the game. Basically, more forest is what this will all enable us to do, and that's pretty much it. Thank you for listening. Less forest. <laughs> Less forest. More forest. Okay. <laughs> and the two of you have made amazing work on behalf of a lot of users. And how do the users value that asset as well? Like, I guess I'm trying to get to that analogy with you, Daniel, about the breakup. You're looking at two parties who know each other. Mm -hmm. But we're, we're hearing this morning from artists who are making work and then engaging with parties who don't know each other. Does that change your thinking about that? Something you can... Okay. I think... I think in some ways uh, our relationship is really funny because with with the game and the players and their data assets that they make because as we were talking about they create a lot of things around our game like stories um, the characters that they th they imagine that their deer are and stuff like that we, we created a community site for them in like 2007 or something and we sort of were, have been always very hands off about it and hardly only paying half attention to it but they've created a lot of things there and we always feel so responsible like but we can't can't control that, like we don't know what's going to happen to it, and we feel very um, weird about the fact that one day we might have to take that part of the game away from them, mm -hmm. and and we don't know what to do. <laughs> so it's like we're sort of like, how do we, how do we? It's because because of that aspect of nobody's paying us to do this, mm -hmm. like how to to take care of this aspect of what has been always on the side of the game, and yet we 
like created that too. I don't know. So while I was watching your presentation, I was sort. That's what I was thinking about anyway. Because you, you're breaking up with your. You'd be breaking. You'd be splitting them up from a part of the, the thing that they grew up with. You know what I mean? Like we've had players who literally were like 12 when they started playing the game, and now they are graduating from university with a master's degree, and they'll write to us and they say, "Oh, it was so special in my life, and like I had my character's name was this, and like he he really enjoyed this, and like you know these grown people talking about their their animal yeah. persona or whatever." And um, and you feel like you want to um, honor that on some level. Can yeah. I ask you a question? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Like, why is that something that you kept separate from the game, like on the sideline? Why is that not something? You, is it something you ever wanted to integrate in? Actually, we, we didn't want that at all. I mean, like we said, we we designed the game without chat. We wanted people to just be dear, but it was really a demand from the players. And and um, and yeah, at, at some point we, we really want listen to players and and wanted to uh, to accommodate them. Um, and, uh, and 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 so we had like a forum, for instance, a general tale of tales forum where people could talk about all our games, but it was just the endless, endless forest players who just took over that forum. We said, okay guys, here, have your own site <laughs> for, for all those things that you want to talk about. Um, and and uh, But for us, this was not so important. It was really for them, but of course it runs on our server, so you know we have a certain responsibility there, and they do ask us sometimes when there's... It happens really rarely, but sometimes there's a bit of harassment or whatever, yeah. and then, then we need to intervene, but yeah, it's mostly yeah. self-run. We never, we never really wanted it, though, because of this um, aspect of it being, um, like, okay, so something would happen, like we, uh, a player would die. This has happened a couple of times. A player has died or ha has committed suicide. There was another time. And like, and it would spread like wildfire through the community site, for example, and we would get hysterical young people writing to us, um, demanding that we memorialize them and in the forest because they were a player and it was, they were dedicated to the world, game world. And, and you don't know how to feel about that, yeah. you know? It's like, uh, yeah, I don't know what your input to this or your reaction to something like that would be, but I mean, it's a, it's a funny thing. Yeah, well, it goes to show just how much it means to, to them in general. It reminds me of, um, so, I uh, don't know if you can tell by looking at me, but I played a lot of Warcraft in my time. Uh. Um, but in, in Warcraft, they, if someone passed away that was big in a the community, they would have a lot of people do something in the game. They wouldn't memorialize them, but the players would do something. Yeah, Is that, that ever happens. something that, yeah? yeah. The like players, players would do something, things like, you know, they'd have a, a special day and they would ask us to change, to make it rain or something like this in the forest. Some, the first time we, that this happened or we felt we're really t sad ourselves and um, so we put a big star in the middle of the forest and a, and a candle and all the deer would come and they sat in a circle around the candle and it was just really, like we're like weeping. Yeah, but there was a, a problem with that which made us yeah, sort of yeah. doubt that because yeah. Of course, it's a game without any speaking, and and it's a, you know a silly, funny deer game. Yeah. So not everybody is aware of this situation. So then some deer come, oh, this yeah. deer's running, uh, sitting in a circle. I'm just going to run over this candle, and and they th you know the other deer were, this is disrespectful. But we get hysterical they didn't know. emails from people like they desecrated the side of like you know like oh gosh, you know. Or there were times, but um, yeah, I mean there's so many stories. I don't know. I don't want to things like this. Or um, times when in the past like uh, to talk about digital harassment um, and ways that the, the, the design the, another reason we didn't want these two things worlds to come together is that the game was designed to prevent harassment and it was actually quite effective in that and then back in the days of uh, there was this forum called something awful <laughs> And um, we found a plot on something, something awful's form where they were going to come. They thought our game was dumb, you know. We're going to go. We're going to grief those deer. We're going to, we're going to like <laughs> attack. Okay, we're going to all go at this time, and we're all going to like do stuff. And then the thread went on. Like, there's no way to upset the other deer. <laughs> they just think you're playing. Like, you know. Like, and they were getting more and more frustrated with them. There was no way. So they developed the, the only thing they could do was to make a lot of noise because our deer, you can go Moo, really loud uh, yeah. in the game. So they. So we responded to that together. too. So we responded to that when we realized what <laughs> they were doing. We, we like made it so that the deer could only 
that could only like moo like um, a few times, full full volume, and then it would get softer and softer, and then there would come out a bubble. <laughs> and so like the whole sky ended up being filled with bubbles, and like you know, and uh, and so this was our reaction to it, and the, being able to react to something like that was important to us. So we didn't want we don't want to support any situation where it's easy to make each other upset because to us this was really about utopia. We were hoping that people, I mean, we had our deeper conceptual aims with it. Like, we were hoping that people would take this experience of harmony in the game into their, into the real world in some way, you know? And, um, yeah, so it's just really funny, like, <laughs> things like this. Do you have questions? Oh, uh, yeah. Hi. Um, so, so Daniel, in your in your work, you mentioned um, sort of uh, people's reactions to breakups as, as one of three sort of modes. One one was saving things, mm -hmm. one was deleting things, and one was just not looking at them yep. again. And that, um, the, from a sort of a game design parlance, that's like verbs, three verbs that you have. Okay, yeah. um, something that I think you know, the, maybe the game design aspect or that that Tale of Tales is bringing. Uh, to this discussion is like the addition of more verbs and the ability to do different things. Right in in endless forest, you can have um, events. You can have you can you can run around and do things. Um, I'm wondering if you, the future of dealing with digital breakups, you know, can can involve something like creating something or making something new or performing a ritual. Right, like performing some sort of uh, virtual. Uh, Event, um, which which people certainly do in real life, right? They they have a memorial or or a um, commemorating kind of thing. I'm just curious about your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. Um, thank you. So this is something that uh, that I had. So this idea that that they are verbs. So there's actually um, Microsoft did research and has has categorized these actions as grammars of action. And so it's that idea that you can save, delete, update, and hide, I think, or the things that they say you can do to any file. And so I had an idea that I would kind of make these, um, make new interactions or more meaningful, and it's that idea of making it more of a, what was the word you used? A, oh, ritual. A ritual, yeah. And so rather than just deleting a digital possession, I thought it would be nice to like nuke a di digital <laughs> possession. And so <laughs> the process is that it gets deleted, but also it gets removed from the recycle bin, and then your hard drive gets defragmented so that it's gone. <laughs> and that's that idea that there's more to it than just that simple action. So yeah, definitely, I think there's a lot to, to be looked at there. Other questions? We have time. Yeah. I'll go back here. So I'm going to Uh, this is for Tale of Tales. Have you considered how much you've influenced uh, games that came after? Uh, most notably, Journey springs to mind, since it's, you can only communicate with your randomly assigned partner through whistles, and you can only see them through a pictogram above their head. Mm -hmm. Just have you noticed anything else? Um, yeah, I mean, that's a very good one, though, because I mean, we know the people who made Journey, and not that, you know, I mean, they, they recognize the fact that, that, that the Endless Forest inspired them, but I also think it's it's kind of a logical design when you think about uh, playing. I mean, when you sort of abandon conventions of game design, it's not so hard to, to think about. Um, and I think that happens all the time, um, and I would like, I like to think that we inspire that kind of thinking, trying to get away from thinking in, in game conventions, but just looking at the medium itself, at what the computer can do, and then playing with that and being creative with that. Um, I mean, we're flattered when, when, you know, there's sort of more direct quotes of our games, but uh, I, I don't consider that to be deep influence or something. It's just sort of more like... Uh, I don't know. There's been a couple. Yeah? Uh, like uh, Wolf this? Game, what was it? Wolf Quest was one to, to directly answer your question. Like there was one called Wolf Quest, and there's another one, um, Shelter. Right. Yeah, Shelter, which was made by. Uh, why can't I remember Martin their names? 
Might and Delight, yeah, Might and Delight, Shelter, really cute game. Like so, it it had uh, there was there was direct influence like that with other animal themed games, I think, and then there's uh, the sort of Journey influence, but they're very much um, very interesting designers who influenced us as well. And there, we had a, a big exchange back then, um, us and uh, that game company who made Journey, uh, very good friends. So it um, we we enjoy that. Like we wish that had happened more often, actually, because of our sort of utopian ideal, uh, I guess, it, of this game design. Um, we we hoped that it would have been more influential in a way, like, and, and more designers would have considered um, alternative ways of presenting um, uh, people being together in, in a game world and not um, always do, using the same models all the time, you know, and the same... Um, you know, sort of, uh, yeah, World of Warcraft kind of uh, model, you know, which was so popular at the time that we were making this game. You know, we want, we always wanted to present alternative realities, I guess, <laughs> instead of um, the same old thing. So, yeah. So I think one of the one of the coolest things about your game is that the deers can only change other people's appearances. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about in terms of Daniel's research how. Um, you could only really create your own digital possessions, and I wondered, could it be a very kind of cathartic process to allow other people right. randomly to create possessions? I don't, I don't know. If you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. yeah. Do you mind if I... Please, please. Yeah. So you, you mean anyone in particular, or so like an ex, yeah. or you just put them out on it? <laughs> That's a lot of trust for the internet, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. Depends yeah, on but it's it a ritual, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, kind of like online, online, you know, like when they burn, like online burn barrels kind of, kind of idea. Oh, yeah, um, rummage sale. So I don't know. I don't know if it would work, but... Yeah. <laughs> Collaborative curation, maybe? It might be less, like, you might be less of an emotional process because somebody else is doing that for you. That would also be kind of terrifying, though. Like, could you imagine putting all your, all of your digital things out on the internet for someone to rifle through and... Yeah, but... It's not little there anyway, really. <laughs> The fear. The yeah. 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 I can think of a number of works of net art that have done this, right? I yeah, mean, yeah, there's yeah. even Franco Matta's file sharing, life sharing yeah. project, which allowed that. Yeah. And then in response to that, Kojic made a work called File Extinguisher, which did allow you to sort of blow up yeah. your documents and make sure they were properly deleted. I think in order to do that, you had to upload the documents to Vuk's server, which was kind of cheeky, right? Cause yeah. There was also he wasn't gonna keep uh, one where you played a video game and every time you died, a a random file was deleted from your hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and, and so you, but you didn't know which one. You know, it would That's just awesome. delete a file and you would just be I like, that. okay. <laughs> you know? That's really cool. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to mention the work you've done on um, working in the social field. Sure. Um, you've you've sort of brought something alive for me about the dangers. I mean, that is yeah. extreme stuff, and really, um, where is this heading in maybe the legal fields? Is do, do you know anything like that so, about yeah. how people can be protected in this? So I think that's a really good question. The the legal kind of side of it is not something that I've looked at. Um, I just I don't have the the expertise to. But it's uh, kind of, I think the idea is that if you think about it before you post it or you think about it before you share the information, that's your best bet. Because once it's out there, it's out there. Um, and it's kind of like if you share a secret with one person, then it goes on and on and on and outlives just that one person. So, yeah. We have time for one, one more quick question. Oh, <laughs> some hesitant hands, but Jeanette was fastest. It's just a very quick question for Daniel. I just wanted to know about the age limit. Um, sure. Yeah, of your of the people you were interviewing, you mm -hmm. interviewees. Um, yeah, why was there this age limit? I'm just curious. Ah, so the the lower age limit of 18? No, 52. Oh, that, that wasn't a limit. That was that would have been a cool limit though. 52, very strange. <laughs> but that was just that my oldest participant was 52. Yeah, there was no upper limit. I would have taken anybody. <laughs> That's yeah. super, that was super quick question, so I'm allowing one more super quick question. I, I remember playing a game you made on a churchyard. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, what, is, what yeah. was it called? The churchyard? Yeah. The game, the graveyard. Yeah. The graveyard. The graveyard. Where uh, the, the, the character only had to walk along. Very, very old lady only had to walk along and maybe turn in a corner. Yeah. Or uh, These to say that I really enjoy the idea of people uh, trying to make uh, works where you don't perform anything. Right. Or you right. perform the minimum of thing and you just enjoy an environment. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's, well, it's, maybe the contrary of what is supposed to a game to be. Mm -hmm. Like you have to perform something. Yeah. So we are, what about that? Is yeah. that your philosophy? For it's us, it, it's performing. always been about being a character in an environment. We started uh, with that in mind every single time. Um, and uh, just to be in the environment was enough for us. So we tried to make uh, experiences where it would be enough for other people as well. And to make that an interesting thing. And you know, we always say, well, yeah, the Endless Forest, you can do all these, other, these different things, but the real main action in the Endless Forest is running. And this feeling um, of connection and freedom that you have by running through a forest is really powerful and f it works for a lot of people apparently or they wouldn't keep coming back because that's really what you do most of the time is you're just running around <laughs> you know and it but it's making it or sleeping yeah and so it's about making you feel that you know like you're there you know and, and for us the experience didn't have to look real but it had to feel real and so going for that feeling can we give a huge round of thanks to our <laughs>